Hello plant people, how are you guys doing today? If you're new around here, my name is Ashley and I'm a soil scientist on this channel. I like to take that science and apply it to all things plants. And in today's video, we're gonna be talking about compost tea. So this was an incredibly highly requested video. So I want you guys to let me know in the comments down below what your process for making compost tea is, whether or not it works for you. And be sure to include the type of compost you are using. Is it bagged compost or is it stuff that you're making from home? Remember, the comment section is equally as valuable as my videos and my talking head is. And I have many subscribers that have told me that. So I am not the star of the show. We are the star of the show together here on this channel. With that being said, be sure to give this video a thumbs up hit that subscribe button and i have to apologize for whatever reason i do not know why youtube is deleting randomly deleting people's comments so if i'm not getting to your comment and you left a comment make sure to check the comments section to ensure that it is still there because youtube may have decided to just randomly delete it unfortunately i i haven't figured out what's going on but it's a thing for whatever reason so in today's video, we are going to be, I guess this could technically be a part of the Garden Hack series. So I, with that series, if you guys are not familiar with that, I go through different garden hacks that have been presented by other influencers, by the internet, Facebook groups, that sort of thing, and I debunk them with science or I bump them up with science, I guess you could say, because not all of them are debunked. And the compost tea is one of those topics that i am so on the fence about and the reason i'm on the fence about it is because i'm not entirely sure whether or not it works and the reason for that is because the theory supports why it could work but there isn't enough research to show it does work and the research that is out there in the scientific journals that i found while trying to research for this video for example are showing the opposite of what we would expect when using a compost tea in the garden. So we're gonna go through this, we're gonna break down these scientific journals, we're going to break down the process of making compost tea and how to make this correctly and some of the mistakes you can make. And then from there, I'm going to put my personal spin on it using soil science theory, using plant science theory, my education, to give you guys an idea of where I'm coming from and in some respects how I think that this could work and in what ways it's going to work and, and kind of what results you're going to see. So again, I'm on, the, I'm on the fence about this. Let's start a discussion in the comments down below. Let me know where you come from. This video is specific to compost tea, meaning the tea that is um, processed over one to three days, not the fermented stuff. So if you want a video on the fermented version, be sure to let me know in the comments down below and I will make that video for you. But without further ado, let's jump into the world of composted tea fertilizer stuff. So when we look at compost tea and we look at the literature and how this stuff is made, the very common components of a compost tea is a compost, whether that be bagged from the store or from the garden itself, placed into a bucket, typically five gallon pail, inside of a sock or a potato sock to avoid the particulates mixing with the water too aggressively. And then dipping that into the water, adding in some molasses or a sugar, some sort of carbohydrate into the mix with a aerator. So the aerator then bubbles like just a fish tank bubbler. And so let's let's dig into this and break down what's even just happening with that process. When we look at a compost tea and how it's made, we have that um, sock initially and that really isn't too too important I think the reason why people add that in or the brains behind adding that in is because it would be watered on top of the plant and when it is watered on top of the plant what we would 
tend to expect is those little particulates of organic material decomposed plant matter will end up on the leaves of the plant which can be less than appealing it, it's not going to look very good after we finish watering with a compost tea compound so that's the purpose of the sock other than that there's really no rhyme or reason to it you could just throw it into the container if you don't mind a bit of organic material potentially sitting on your leaf leaves for example after that, we add the sugar. So why the sugar? The sugar is important. The sugar is what is going to cause those microbes to grow and expand at a rapid rate. Something above and beyond what would naturally happen if we just added compost to some warm water. So because we have those carbohydrates in there, any microbial activity that was happening inside that compost initially is going to explode because now it has an alternate food source that is much more available for our seemingly, you know, lazy microbes for lack of a better term. That is what the purpose of that sugar is. The problem is, is if we don't supply that continuous form of carbohydrate and sugar on a regular basis, what will tend to happen is we will have a massive influx of microbes. And we've talked about this when we looked at the molasses myth. We'll have a massive influx of microbes and then a sudden die off because we have more microbes than our compost can feed given what our compost has. So the purpose of the sugar is to nurture and grow the microbes that are already present in that composted material. That means if we have solarized compost material, if we have manure, meaning animal byproduct compost, we will have two things happen. First of all, with the manure, we will very likely end up with um, E. coli and some very harmful byproducts, um, microbes growing up. And then if we have solarized compost, we will end up with a lower level of diverse microbial activity and we will just end up with the scragglers that made it through the solarization of that compost itself. So we want a compost that is relatively untouched and has zero um, manure um, or animal byproduct involved because we want to stay away from those very harmful bacterial, fungi, you know, that sort of fun stuff. And then the last key feature to this is the actual aeration. So that bubbler being placed into the water. And the purpose for this is because we want to try to keep this composty aerobic, meaning oxygen positive rather than oxygen depleted, which would be anaerobic. So anaerobic bacteria can be the source of things such as um, root rot, for example, stem rot, blight, as all negative, typically anaerobic or relatively anaerobic microbes. So when we have aerobic um, water, we end up with aerobic microbes. So that is what is happening on that side of it. And this is very commonly known by quite a few uh, fish enthusiasts. For example, I used to be a huge fish enthusiast and you don't want aerators in aquatic plant tanks because uh, they will have a higher level of CO2. And as we know, plants use CO2 to grow and consume it. So when we have aerators in plant tanks, for example, underwater, we actually are releasing the CO2 and we're bringing in too much oxygen, which will have the opposite effect of what we're going for when we're actually trying to grow aquatic plants. So that is what the purpose of that aerator is, just to keep think things O2 positive and therefore keep those beneficial aerobic bacteria on the top notch, which is what we need bacteria wise for actual uh, decomposition of soil organic material, that sort of fun stuff. When I was looking at the claims of what compost tea does from the internet's perspective, it provides nutrients, it actually prevents disease, and increases the levels of bacteria, fungi, nematodes, protozoa in the soil itself and some other kind of semi outrageous claims but so i think a huge thing with the compost tea is the moisture and the fact that we're actually watering our plants i commonly see this in both the host plant community and the garden community there is a lack of watering for whatever reason we assume plants are always going to die of root rot and more commonly than not i see plants either dying or very commonly struggling to survive based on the fact that we are underwatering. So the 
I always see this phenomenon with with crazy products such as Marifel or Super Thrive or compost tea, we end up actually watering our plants more often. And, and when we water our plants more often, surprise, we end up with healthier, better plants. So I don't think it's a direct cause of the compost tea having these amazing compounds in it. I think it's actually more of a reflection on us as plant owners going out and watering our gardens more often. So the benefit of adding these microbes into the soil, the likelihood of microbes being added to the soil from a compost tea surviving long term is next to none. I mean, typically speaking, the microbes we find in the soil itself are going to be drastically different than something we see in a water-based environment or an aquatic environment. And this is just you know, normal. This is normal. You're not going to find the same microbes in the beach at a lake as you are going to find in the lake itself. <laughs> now you're probably thinking to yourself, well, that's why you added the compost and the compost purpose was it to develop and help uh, compost decomposers thrive, which would be very similar to the microbes you would find in the soil. And yes, this is true, but the problem is, is that we grew those microbes based on a sugar-based formula, so an absolute influx of sugar, and now we're about to place them in the soil, in the dirt, whether that be potting soil or the soil itself, and we really don't have the carbohydrates or the sugar to feed the masses that we have now injected into the soil profile. So do I think it's a good supplement for a poor soil? Yes. Do I think that a healthy, thriving, um, microbially active soil is going to benefit from this hugely? Probably not. You're probably not going to see a huge benefit. And if you're confused as to whether or not, you know, your soil is microbially active, be sure to check out my video on how to actually test the microbes within the soil itself. It's kind of a fun little test you can do at home, and it's a good indicator as to whether or not you should be using something such as a compost tea to just level up in the microbial activity of your soil or if you are probably okay. So if you have already microbial active soil, I don't see a huge benefit to this injection of microbes itself. Now the claim for nutrients and the fact that it is able to provide nutrients is pretty weak. So it most likely, if you were to test this uh, compound, it would have a lower rate of NPK sulfur than a regular fertilizer would be that is organic. So organic already has a low number because it's not necessarily bioavailable right off the hop. So I would suspect that compost tea is even lower than that is, and that is what the studies and the science is showing us. So it's a very watered down version of a organic fertilizer so that isn't too much of a hit home point for me either now one thing to note with the compost tea and the nutrients color doesn't equal nutrients it's as simple as that so that coloration that you see in the water itself is actually tannins um, so it's just the natural dyes that come off of decomposing plant material there it's not an indicator of more or less nutrients so the darker brown it is it's not really it doesn't mean anything so um, tannins are very common in any sort of organic material it's the natural coloration of plant is, is what it comes down to so if you've been to um, a lake that is very very brown in color it probably has a lot of rotting trees in it um, that sort of thing. So all that stuff I talked about before from the increase in moisture, the maybe subtle increase in microbes, all the way to the lower amounts of nutrients is, you know, a combination of scientific journals and my personal opinion of why it, it may work for some people or you may see some benefits to it. Now, when we look into the actual journals of this on the science side that have been published, by universities there's zero um, data to suggest that this does anything which I mean it and it's because it's very hard to control a study like this it's very very hard to um, you know point the finger at whether or not it was compost tea that provided the benefits or if it was something else um, within the soil system itself so that is kind of why these studies are a little bit lax one thing I did find in quite a few journals that 
studied more of the disease control side of things did suggest that it can make disease worse to worse because whatever's in the compost especially if it's an at-home compost is probably um a disease that already exists when in your garden so uh, powdery mildew for example and when you compost tea it you are now feeding those fungal spores or those bacterial spores whatever the case is and you're amplifying an already issue within your compost itself um, and then applying it back onto your garden so it can actually cause more issues than not conversely I mean, they could flip this on its head and use science to show the opposite, in my opinion, where if they had a soil or a plant material that was incredibly good at uh, preventing or eating up powdery mildew fungi or a specific bacteria that was harmful to plants and you then uh, teed it or you fermented it and you exasperated it, increased it within a water system and then you applied that to the soil in theory that would be like an inoculant as a preventative so that's something to keep in mind as well what is in your plant or in your garden to begin with and whether or not your compost tea is going to exasperate an already issue or if it's going to actually make it better but that is all i have for you guys on compost tea it is it's it's out for debate still there's not a lot of scientific journals on it um there's not a lot of info on it we can apply science to it but the science would tell us you know you run the risk of harmful um, bacteria buildup such as e coli or you could end up with um, you know beneficial bacterial buildup in my opinion that would end up eating stuff so you have beneficial microbes beneficial bacteria beneficial fungi so it all kind of depends but again it's very hard to control whether you get the beneficial ones or the negative ones especially because it's a very dirty environment no pun intended uh, be sure to give this video a thumbs up again hit that subscribe button if you enjoyed this video and you made it this far i want to thank you guys so much for watching and i will talk to you guys next time bye